I think we have everyone on. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the October 19th Public Design Commission hearing. Uh, if you're watching via YouTube, you can, uh, sorry, you can find links in the description of the video, below the video, to the agenda, which has the presentations included, and uh, links to uh, instructions on how to participate, including how to join the Zoom meeting if you would like to give public testimony, and a link to the public testimony sign-in form. We have one person signed up. Uh, to testify. Uh, so please sign up if you would like to do so. And uh, we will do start with the consent agenda and go on to the um, Brooklyn Resilience, or sorry, downtown Manhattan Resiliency Project. I think, Signe, we are ready to begin. Uh, good morning. My name is Signe Nielsen, president, president of the Public Design Commission. Um, the public meeting is now commencing. I'm gonna start with a roll call. If you're here, please uh, state your name. Bill Ahrens. Um, I think Lori Hawkinson. Here. Manuel Miranda. Here. Susan Morgenthau. Here. Ethel Sheffer. Here. Meryl Tisch. She's I believe she's on. Um, Phone. She she is on the phone um, and she is unmuted. Please note that Commissioners Moore and Valverde are not in attendance. So now we'll start by voting on the consent agenda. We have items number 27585 through item 27604. Staff has noted Commissioner Hawkinson's recusal on item 27585. Are there any other recusals that have not been noted? Okay. Um, for the, uh, let the record show there are no further recusals. So I'll now call for a vote. Um, commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote for the consent agenda. You may approve or reject all. You may also reject or abstain from individual projects. Um, Phil Ahrens. Approve all. Lori. Approve. Manuel? Approval. Susan? Approval. Ethel? Approval. Meryl? Let's assume that's an approval. Well, we do need her, and I'm approving all. Um, we do need um, Meryl's vote on Lori's uh, recused project. So now let us uh, move on to the public hearing. So per standard proce procedure, the applicants will give their presentation, then public testimony will be heard, and then the commissioners will ask questions, deliberate, and vote. So first on our agenda today is item 27605, flood protection measures as part of the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resiliency Plan in Manhattan. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Messier. I'm with the ACOM team. Um, before we begin this presentation, I just want to note that we have a lot of slides to get through. So in order to leave adequate time for questions at the end, we'll be going through a number of these slides very, very quickly. 
Um, however, we're certainly happy to return to any of the slides during the Q&A, so we can always go back and discuss them further if needed. Next slide. Um, uh, yes, so this is our agenda. Just a quick reminder, um, items one through three are a recap of um, what was in the conceptual submission that we did last year. Um, and then in um, four through six, we'll introduce some new elements to the project. Next slide. Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency is the plan to protect Lower Manhattan from climate change for this generation and the next. The city is investing $500 million in resilience projects that will be constructed by 2022. And the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience Project will reduce flood risk while maintaining the, the community's views and access to the waterfront. So BMCR is located in the Two Bridges neighborhood of Manhattan and the flood protection system will extend from the Brooklyn Bridge to Montgomery Street. On the next slide, you'll see that the project area also overlaps with the existing East River Esplanade packages two and three, um, or three and four. And we have also been coordinating public program and amenities with the Brooklyn Bridge Esplanade to the south in order to minimize overlap between our two projects. The next slide illustrates that the majority of our project area is beneath the elevated FDR, and it's too shaded to incorporate new plantings, although the ERE and the BBE projects do introduce a few planters at the water's edge, shown here in green. The next three slides are existing site photos. Um, here we're looking at fishing and seeding along the waterfront that currently exists as part of the East River Esplanade. Um, here it's residents making use of flexible open spaces. And finally, the well-used existing basketball and fitness areas, um, which we, we will be replacing in kind as part of this project. The Two Bridges uh, neighborhood has spectacular, iconic views of the East River and, and the Brooklyn and Manhattan bridges. However, the waterfront is already constrained by the overhead FDR, and we understand that it's critical to preserve the existing views and access to the waterfront as much as possible. The need to preserve waterfront views and access was a major driver behind the flood protection design. On the next slide, you'll see that the proposed flood protection alignment uh, will maximize the use of flip-up gates, shown here in orange, along the waterfront as much as possible. Flip-up gates are stored flush with the ground when they're not in use, preserving waterfront views and access. At the southern end of the project, the flood protection ties into high ground underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Along the waterfront, the alignment typically, the typical condition is that it runs down the middle of the esplanade between the FDR columns. However, here, just south of Catherine Slip, the alignment does shift slightly inland and runs beneath the bike lane in order to avoid underground sewer infrastructure. At Market Slip, a combination of flood wall and roller gate will be used again to avoid underground sewer infrastructure. And finally, to the north at Pier 35, a combination of flood wall and swing gates will be used to avoid the underground sewer infrastructure. And then from Pier 35 north to Montgomery Street, where we tie into high ground, waterfront views are already obstructed by buildings on Pier 36, such as the sanitation facility, so the flood protection will consist of primarily flood wall with roller gates provided for vehicular access to the parking lot. More detail about the flood infrastructure will be shown later in the presentation. Uh, the flood walls and gates are designed to minimize flood risk due to a 100 year storm in the 2050s. However, the flood protection will also be installed, installed on top of a raised platform shown here in the middle image in order to address more frequent sunny day tidal flooding due to sea level rise. Ramps and steps will be built into the platform to provide access to the waterfront and the platform will widen in some areas to accommodate public program as shown in the image on the right in orange. The next slide shows that the existing esplanade slopes down from the bulkhead towards South Street. So as the sea level rises, high tides and small storms will begin to overtop the bulkhead and flow into the neighborhood, flooding streets and basements. The raised platform ranging from one and a half to two and a half feet high will reduce the risk of sunny day tidal flooding while providing um, uh, public areas for a program. The floodgates built on top of the platform will be deployed during major storm events to reduce flood risk from coastal storms. Okay, so we just walked through the engineering approach behind the design, and this next section will discuss the public realm design. Beyond the flood infrastructure itself, there are a number of other site constraints that factor into the design, including clearances around the FDR columns, footings, and the overhead structure, underground utilities and major sewer infrastructure, access along the waterfront for maintenance and emergency vehicles, and on the, on the inland side, vehicular access perpendicular to the alignment at regular in intervals in order for the um, floodgate deployment operations to take place. Community feedback has been critical to this process. Since 2016, during the LMCR phase, we've have, have held public meetings and workshops, individual stakeholder meetings, walking tours of the site, and small group discussions with community leaders. Some of the key feedback we heard is shown on the next slide. And as we walk through the design and the following slides, you'll begin to see how the team incorporated this feedback, feedback wherever feasible. And finally, on the next slide, 
Uh, I'd just like to point out before we get into some more of the design details, that this project will also continue the existing bike lane design and will provide a critical connection between the BBE bike lane to the south and the ERE bike lanes uh, to the north. And from here, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Hogan. Great, thank you, Lauren. Um, and I apologize in advance, there may be a little bit of background noise, there's some trucks in my neighborhood. Um, and just a reminder, we are, we'll be going through these pretty quickly, um, as Lauren mentioned. Um, so our project here is, is organized into four pro programmatic design zones, um, the social pockets, passive pockets, active pockets, shown in the orange, pink, and blue, and uh, fixed structures uh, bookending the project to the north and south. Well, you know. Um, the social pockets are meant to attract and support activity aligned with the intersections. Um, throughout the project, we have worked closely with our agency partners to address the ease of construction and maintenance um, in these areas and the project as a whole. Um, on the right, you can see the materials and their associated design features and programs. Um, we've identified um, opportunities for bright color and pattern on the RPL slats in number four and the flip up gates shown in number one. Um, each social pocket is organized around uh, gathering areas shown in number four on either side of a central flexible use platform aligned with the um, view sheds um, from each street. Um, within each social pockets, the circulation supports the access to the platform walk and gathering areas and the ramps on the water side are located to support north and south movement along the Esplanade. Um, now I'm gonna walk through um, each social pocket starting with Catherine Slip. Um, the design of these uh, social pockets as we go through them are the result of many conversations with the team and the local community, as well as a response to the specific site conditions. Here at Catherine Slip, um, we follow our uh, typical layout pretty closely with a flexible use space in the middle and gathering areas on the left and the right. In the plan, you can see the clearances around um, the HPUs along the uh, raised platform walk, as well as um, in, uh, in front of the stairs and the FDR columns. And the dashed lines here show that 12 foot access aisle to the flip up gates by a DOT for emergency manual deployment that Lauren mentioned. Um, and the circulation uh, follows the typical circulation with the ramp um, centered in the middle um, and access to the esplanade um, and the gathering areas uh, to the left and right. Uh, as we look in the views, um, you can start to see some of the, the, uh, the project components um, in their uh, final form. Um, and these are really uh, based around these conversations we've had with the team and the community um, and represent a, a really technically feasible and constructible approach um, to meeting some of the design challenges that Lauren mentioned in terms of sea level rise, while also providing gathering spaces um, for the community. In the foreground, we have our precast concrete uh, seats with the orange recycled plastic lumber cladding. And on the right is that raised HPU on top of the, the flip up gate platform and the same view um, when there is a storm event. Looking from the land side, um, you can see here the raised platform on the left with the patterning achieved by different colors of the anti-slip finish, as well as our uh, precast stairs that are built on the edge of that structural platform and our ramps with signage opportunities at the intersections. And the same view in a flood event. Moving on to market slip, um, the underground sewer chamber here at the uh, intersection of Market Slip and South Street necessitates the use of a roller gate in the center of the intersection. Um, the enclosure of this roller gate HBU and storage, storage area um, uses a louvered screen, um, which you'll see in a view coming up. Um, at Market Slip, um, because of this roller gate in the center, we've arranged the gathering areas to the north and south and the flexible use space a little bit farther south of that. So here in the view, you can see um, the, the view out to the Manhattan Bridge, that louvered screen concealing the HPU, um, as well as the flood walls uh, surrounding that, that roller gate. Uh, the maintenance of the flood walls have really been a primary concern of the team, and the design as shown provides ease of inspection and maintenance. Um, a possible lighting installation is being discussed um, with the Parks Department in this area as well. Um, at Pike Slip, um, on the Esplanade side, we're uh, keeping clear of the existing planters um, to reduce any impacts there and providing vehicular access along the esplanade. Um, so we have our step seating um, on the south with our game tables. Um, and on the right, it's a little bit narrow to provide that access through um, and the flexible use space in the center. In plan, again, you can see those clearances around the planters and the ramps on either side providing access to the esplanade. 
and the circulation. Um, and in this view, you can see one of the conditions we have along the land side, um, which is taking these uh, precast seats and stacking them to provide um, different opportunities for seating at the intersections. In Rutgers Slip, um, we are bookended on the north and south um, by some of the active areas. You can see the fitness areas sneaking up on the right and down here climbing, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail in a second. And you can see in this view, uh, the clearances around um, the key critical infrastructure um, and also this anti-slip coating, um, providing that patterning um, in, the, in the plan and also in the view. Um, and we've worked uh, with our agency partners um, to develop a pattern, which again, um, provides us kind of ease of uh, maintenance and uh, meets all the technical requirements for this project. Moving into the passive pockets, um, our typical uh, programming material for the passive pockets um, includes um, gliders, um, which are a really popular element um, on the site today, and we're introducing that into the areas in between the intersections. Um, these gliders, the structure of the gliders can provide us a really nice vertical pop of color, um, and um, from which we will hang the uh, same glider seats as exist out there today. Um, in between the intersections, uh, the uh, the land side, excuse me, the land side is a little bit simpler. Um, so we've simplified the conditions along South Street here to remove seating and program. And really these passive areas provide access to the esplanade and seating with views out. Um, at Catherine and Market Slip here, you can see in between Catherine and Market Slip here in this view, um, there is uh, our waterfront seating uh, with views out over the esplanade and the people walking there. Um, and our gliders um, in the center here. In this view, um, you can see how these elements are arranged, uh, the vertical gliders along with the, the vertical element of the HPU on the right, um, and these precast concrete seats um, with the RPL slats on the uh, raised platform with an opportunity for signage down here um, in the foreground. Um, in Market and Pike Slip, it follows a very similar uh, organization uh, with gliders in the center and gathering areas to the left and right. Um, and you can see in this view, again, that kind of really nice pop of color the gliders give you. Um, the active pockets to the north and south are by far the most complex um, parts of the project in terms of the amount of program we have. Um, in Wagner Place here, we have the opportunity to introduce um, a basketball, half basketball court, uh, picnic areas, and also an informal performance space along the land side here. Um, this area has been carefully arranged around these access requirements um, for emergency manual deployment of the gates, as well as to the HPUs themselves. And you can see that circulation providing ease of access to all of the different seating areas, as well as a, a, a good amount of companion seating. Um, in this view, um, taken from the performance space looking out, um, some of the materials become obvious, such as the precast seats in the front with those recycled plastic lumber, um, orange slats on top, um, giving a little bit more interest in attracting that activity. Um, we have the color seal asphalt coating, um, which we're using as some of the, um, the uh, ground plane materials in the foreground, and then the flip up gate in the background with that patterning on the gates themselves. And the view from the gate, looking at the basketball courts. Oops, excuse me. And the Southern Plain Fitness, um, we've worked uh, very closely with New York Parks to um, uh, design and select um, the uh, equipment that you see in the views here um, in the upcoming. Um, and these play areas are organized by range, by age range. So on the left side, we have our uh, five to 12 and then um, two to five here uh, shown with the, the patterning. And one more thing to mention here um, shown in the white dashed line um, is another um, underground piece of infrastructure which requires us to move um, any pieces of fitness equipment or play equipment outside of this area. Um, in this view, um, we worked very closely again with parks um, to kind of develop the, the color materials and we're continuing to refine that um, based on park standards um, and have worked closely with our partners to develop the both the arrangement, the color and the patterning of the safety surface, um, the seating, and the colored concrete um, in these areas. Um, so looking at some of the two to five play equipment, um, you can see the, the range of activities that you have here. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but there's um, a good amount of different opportunities for play um, as well as in the five to 12 play equipment. 
And then the final piece, um, introducing that idea of topographic play, um, we have a large piece of ramped play equipment, um, which is in the southernmost part of the site. Um, some of the fitness equipment, again, working with, um, with our, our agency partners to select um, the equipment that's most appropriate for these areas. Um, finally, the, uh, the play area and a climbing wall to the north. Um, we have a, a tot lot, a two to five year old playground on a raised platform here, and then a climbing structure along the esplanade um, with ping pong tables um, in this area. Um, and this view here shows some of those, um, those play uh, equipments, um, the chit chat noodles and some, some uh, bongo drums along the platform with great views out. Um, we have our fence surrounding these play areas and we are able to lower that to three foot six um, per one of the comments previously. And how this um, really kind of active and vibrant areas ties into the whole um, site in the background, you can see the gliders and the HPUs and a view of that climbing structure along the waterfront. Um, lastly, in the north part of the site, we have our um, fitness area, our active fitness, as Lauren mentioned, replacing what's out there today. Um, this is all located on the race platform itself to reduce exposure to some of those um, low level of flooding events. Um, and you can see the clearances around um, the play equipment um, along these areas of safety surface. And the views from the North Fitness um, back down to the South. And some of these fitness equipments that again, we've worked with parks to select. Moving pretty quickly through this, um, we've uh, been working in concert with the existing Esplanade site furniture that's out there and it's been approved. Some of the pieces that we're using um, from this pallet are the tables and chairs and the gliders, as I mentioned. And we're also introducing uh, these platform benches, which um, speak to the design and inspiration from the East River Esplanade, but are modified to fit this project site. Um, throughout the site, we have a lot of uh, handrails um, along uh, the ramps and stairs um, and fences. And these come together uh, in this diagram here. And then our materials palette, um, we work very closely to kind of develop this um, to be the most robust um, as possible using a lot of precast concrete, um, aluminum tread plate with that slip up, uh, that, that anti-slip finish to provide a two-tone color, um, safety tiles and that color seal asphalt where appropriate. Um, some of the furnishings that we have uh, selected for this project in coordinate with parks. And with that, I will pass it off to Thomas Heltzel from One Architecture to talk a little bit about the fixed structures on either side of the project. Um, the concept being the wall relief modules and then the roller gates with super graphics. Thank you, Hogan. Um, so as Hogan mentioned, uh, I'm going to be talking to uh, kind of the above grade uh, flood protection elements that really consist of walls and above grade gates. And then the last part of the presentation, I'll also speak to the interceptor gate building. Um, so this diagram just gives a quick overview of the different types of exposed flood wall that we have in the project. And that's really namely, uh, if we look to the left side of the page, the Project South, uh, that's the Brooklyn Bridge tie-in, where we have a portion of flood wall that is set against uh, the FDR off-ramp that then transitions to a, a freestanding wall that comes to South Street and then the gate crossing there. And then really the kind of esplanade design um, that Hogan really spoke to. And that's really more takes into account the, the HPUs, which I'll speak to in more detail, as well as a few sections of uh, exposed wall utility crossings. Uh, and then to the right-hand side of the page at the kind of Project North, um, you have Pier 35 and then a long stretch of wall along Pier 36 that will show as an exposed uh, flood wall and then back across uh, South Street to the tie-in at Montgomery Street, uh, which effectively mirrors at that point uh, the tie-in at ESCR and the uh, uh, Montgomery Street tie-in there at Governor Gardens that we'll be uh, taking into account. So on the next slide, um, you can see the kind of uh, suite of uh, uh, form liner toolkits that we're using to um, articulate the, uh, the flood protection, the exposed grade flood walls. And so the first two slides, or first two rows, um, show the suite that we'll be kind of taking from and continuing from ESCR. And the point there is, as I mentioned, at Montgomery Street, where we're effectively mirroring um, the tie-in of ESCR, we'll then kind of use this, uh, this suite of, of form liners uh, from there uh, down through uh, Pier 36. And then as we approach Pier 35 and the kind of Esplanade design of, of BMCR, we'll transition to what we're kind of calling the straight reveal which will be kind of a simpler kind of reveal pattern. Uh, and that will continue all the way to uh, the Brooklyn Bridge time. The main points of, of the kind of flood protection design is that we're, 
we're giving the wall a sense of scale, we're articulating it and um, giving it a bit of relief so that we're kind of providing a, a deterrent um, in any form of, of graffiti. Uh, and then we're also kind of introducing the banding and the elevation on that one foot interval so that uh, throughout the project area, we're kind of reminding people that this is a piece of flood protection that has a relationship to the river. Its height is, um, is integral to that kind of flood protection. Uh, this slide is just quickly showing the kind of idea of where we are using that uh, ESCR uh, wave pattern. We're really cognizant to make sure that we're not really rubber stamping it, but that we're, we're kind of building up the pattern and the rhythm so that it's accelerating and decelerating. And that relates to people's, uh, the viewer's kind of speed, but more importantly, some of the geometry and kind of reinforce the wall and give it a different sense of scale. And we'll also be uh, very cognizant to use as large a panels as we can uh, throughout that project. Uh, on the next slide um, is an overview of the above grade gates that we have. So this is not the flip up gates, but rather roller and uh, swing gates. Um, we have one at market slip that Hogan's already pointed to in the kind of middle of the project. Uh, and then the rest of the above grade gates are all to the right along Pier 35 and Pier 36. For those gates, as you can see on the next slide, um, we're trying to strike a balance here between the design of something that relates to the, the above ground gates shown in ESCR, but also responds to the unique character of BMCR. So to that end, um, the overall gate finish uh, will maintain a very kind of simple, slightly streamlined form um, and just maintain a, a very kind of simple, um, simple construction. Uh, and then where the gates are publicly facing, uh, we'll also be using kind of an etched banding pattern uh, that relates to the straight reveal pattern uh, that's present in both of those areas. And then similarly, we'll be using the same kind of floodgate identifier uh, uh, graphic, and that's will be etched into the floodgate, uh, and that will kind of announce it as a piece of infrastructure, as well as communicate to, uh, for operations for organizational reasons, um, the, the unique piece of infrastructure that needs to, to be operated. Uh, but different, sorry, if you go back one sec, uh, different from, uh, from ESCR, um, we're not going to be using uh, the larger super graphic here. That's just because these gates are so intermittent um, that we're just going to keep the design more simplified. And similarly, using a lighter color, the George Washington gray, so that it sits back against uh, the, um, the concrete a little bit more. It's lot less offset here. Uh, so now, as shown on the next slide, I'm just going to walk through quite quickly uh, the flood protection starting in the south and run up to the north. Uh, so here you can see the tie-in at Brooklyn Bridge with the uh, uh, wall cast against the abutment uh, to the left and then the start of the freestanding wall to the right with the straight reveal pattern. On the next slide, you can see a detail of that connection between the abutment wall uh, and then the start of the freestanding wall where we start the reveal pattern. And then on the next slide, you can see how that wall makes its way down towards South Street crossing. Uh, the intent here is to really make sure we're opening up that intersection as much as possible, uh, one for pedestrian connections, uh, and then two, to make the wall feel where it's quite tall at that area, it's around nine feet tall, um, that it has a bit more of an eased geometry to it, as well as avoiding any kind of corners. And then you can see the crossing gate with the roadway finish. On the opposite side of that road, uh, on the next, yep, uh, sorry, roadway grab finish. Uh, on the opposite side, you see the kind of tie into the integrated HPU and then the kind of the start of the ramp and the podium um, that Hogan has already spoken to. Um, on the next slide is, uh, so this is our typical HPU. Uh, these are, they house uh, the equipment that will operate the gates under normal circumstances. Um, they're about six feet wide and five feet in depth, and they range in height from about eight foot nine to 10 foot five, depending on DFE and the podium height of those locations. Um, something that was really important to us in developing a design is to one, keep them as simple and streamlined as possible, but then um, we wanted to make sure that they, uh, one, had a, a little bit of character that related them to the rest of the landscape design. Uh, and then two, that through their form, um, they, they had a bit more of a dynamic presence so that whenever you're seeing them kind of down the esplanade versus whenever you're walking past them, that their form can be a little bit more dynamic and change a bit. And so we did that through introducing this kind of idea of the battered corner, um, something that just sort of leans the, the, um, the corner back a little bit, reduces the kind of weight and the profile of, uh, of the overall mass of it, um, keeps it a bit more, um, uh, gives it a form that relates to the rest of the project uh, as well. Then whenever you see it kind of on a diagonal versus seeing it straight ahead, uh, it either leans back a little bit or stay, maintains much more of a, a vertical presence. Um, on the next slide is uh, the market slip gate uh, where we're introducing the, the etch pattern on the gate uh, as well as um, the straight reveal on the two walls that, that flank both sides of the gate and capture the end of the podium. You can see that then on the next slide showing the kind of uh, reverse angle 
um, there where we have the screen for the storage area, as well as to kind of direct views and people into the other side of the water, um, we'll have kind of articulation and, and that will align uh, both with the, the podium level as well as the straight reveal. The next slide shows sort of the end of the Esplanade and that's where we transition to uh, at Pier 35 where we transition to the freestanding wall at Pier 36 and the end of the podium. So there our priority was to maintain um, a, as much of a direct connection as possible to the sidewalk along Pier 36. So with two swinging gates and we kind of offset the wall, we're able to maintain a connection to both sides of the uh, of the um, of the podium where you can get to both access points of ramps and stairs and then maintain that area as free as possible and open as possible, um, allowing good connections uh, to the Pier 35 park. Uh, this slide shows uh, the elevation, the longest extent of wall that we have along Pier 36. So in the bottom right hand corner is where uh, Pier 35 starts. Uh, at that point, the wall is around eight feet tall. Uh, and then as grade gradually goes up to the other end, the kind of project north end towards Montgomery Street, which is on the left side of the page, uh, the wall tapers down to about five feet in height. Um, and in this kind of uh, in the right hand portion or bottom right hand portion, you can see at basically as the wall approaches Pier 35, that's where we'll transition from uh, the wave finish that relates to uh, ESCR and the rest of the project to the north uh, and to the, then the straight reveal finish of the MCR. This slide shows how we're treating uh, a typical gate opening at um, along Pier 36. And the important point being here that we're setting back the gate um, a, a few feet, and that's to allow vehicles to enter uh, past, the, past the flood protection to a stop bar before the sidewalk. So we have improved sight lines and safety conditions at this area um, to avoid pedestrian and bicycle conflicts. Um, and then we're also raising the sidewalk in this area um, uh, over the existing conditions um, so that we're avoiding uh, illegal parking there as well as making a kind of clearly defined area for pedestrians to move north-south between um, in this area. Lastly, showing um, the kind of uh, far end of the Pier 36 wall uh, as it's approaching Montgomery Street and the, the gate crossing back to the other side of, um, of South Street. Uh, and we're using uh, an HPU here that's integrated into the wall. And then that will also make the kind of tie into um, the existing chain link fence uh, that's present along that portion of Pier 35. And then last part of the flood protection is to show the tie-in at Montgomery Street. Uh, there, the wall will be cast against a small retaining wall around um, the playground that's there. Uh, the wall is about five feet height uh, along South Street and then tapers down to um, high ground at, uh, along Montgomery Street. In this area, we're of course mirroring basically the, the approach on Governor Gardens on the other side of Montgomery Street. So the wall will have a, uh, a rounded top and skateboard deterrence uh, to avoid setting. Uh, so now I'm going to talk to the interceptor gate building. So this slide is really showing uh, the collection of ESCR interceptor gate buildings as well as BMCR. Uh, and the idea here is that we're really treating these as sort of a family of structures, um, that the three of them are kind of an identifiable set of infrastructure um, throughout, the, throughout the general area. Uh, the next slide shows the kind of existing conditions uh, around where we need to locate this building. Um, and that is namely that uh, there is kind of a large presence of the Brooklyn Bridge kind of overhead uh, that, that kind of impacts the site uh, visually. Uh, that we're being crossed over by an FDR off-ramp um, as well as the DOT yard. And then kind of stitching together of a collection of uh, streets um, at sort of uh, different angles here. Uh, so if you look at the next page, shows the existing uh, site plan. So some of the main constraints that we're working with here is uh, the DOT yard and really minimizing impacts there. Uh, this will be one of the main yards that DOT will be using for operations uh, staging ahead of deploying the flood protection. So make not well, limiting impacts on it, but also improving its condition is a priority for the project. Uh, and then the site is also defined by a collection of below grade and above grade infrastructure. So that's namely what you see in the middle of the screen, the blue dashed in uh, is a combined sewer below grade coming from Smith House across the site, as well as then the above grade infrastructure of the columns and the highway of the BMCR, or sorry, the FDR off-ramp. And then what's really important to us, the site um, is identified by number four there, uh, is this idea of the pedestrian connections. So pedestrians moving uh, kind of north-south on the city side of uh, South Street, we're really met with this rift right here at the site where it's kind of a difficult to know either where to go or make a safe cro crossing. Um, so we really wanna make sure we're kind of improving that and uh, over the existing conditions in our site plan. So on the next site, you see how we reconfigured the site, uh, or next slide. 
Uh, and that shows that we've taken the gate from uh, the current DOT yard, have oriented that towards South Street. That gives DOT direct access to South Street north-south, and that allows us to make uh, Robert Wagner Place for that first stretch, uh, a one-way street, um, and uh, provide area for the building located uh, inboard of uh, the existing infrastructure um, while limiting impacts on the DOT yard. Um, and then through that, we're extending the sidewalk out and making a kind of stronger connection from the, the sidewalk from Smith Houses, a shorter connection uh, past the Green Streets, and then we're pedestrian continued north-south uh, along South Street. This view shows kind of an aerial view, um, looking back towards South Street of the building. Something that's been really important to us for both of the designs for the interceptor gate buildings as such small structures is really thinking of them as three-dimensional objects so that the roof really plays into and plays a part of uh, the building's design. Um, so here you can see the kind of roof slopes down um, and is kind of present uh, in the overall building form. It's kind of like a fifth facade. On the next slide, um, is the kind of overall elevation. Uh, we're again trying to maintain the building as short as possible. So it's max height is 15 feet and the low eave comes down to around 10 feet. Um, using the same material palette that we developed for ESCR with the glass brick. Uh, again, kind of where we do have these longer facades and really trying to uh, break them down and articulate them in kind of eight foot base, something that's more manageable on a, a kind of a, a human scale. And then again, kind of playing this facade or the roof as like a fifth facade element uh, with a flat lock metal panel. Here you can see a view of the building looking back towards Brooklyn Bridge, um, where the brick uh, will kind of play off of hopefully and relate to uh, the articulation of the, the abutment, where, in, where the building has also now been set kind of pr uh, parallel to the bridge, kind of giving a, a degree of order to um, the rest of the site. In the last page, you'll see the material palette is the same that we've developed for uh, ESCR, which is the kind of glass brick and stainless steel trims. The idea that they'll be kind of subtle but dynamic reflections throughout the day of the different building. Um, playing off that kind of idea of the brick context, uh, then the bare gray granite base and the uh, articulation of the flat lock zinc panel. I believe that's it. Great, thank you. So if anyone is watching on YouTube and you want to give public testimony, please sign up. You have to sign up on the form. There's a link to the form below the video and uh, then join the Zoom meeting. There are instructions for doing so also in the description below the video. We do have one person signed up right now for this one, uh, Valentina Jones. I'm going to unmute you. Are you there? Yes, yes, here I am. Hi, okay, Hi. you have three minutes. Okay, um, I'm here on behalf of the Lower East Side Power Partnership. We advocate for flood protection of the residents between Brooklyn Bridge and Montgomery Street. We wrote a letter to EDC uh, in September. We had several issues concerning this project, which were games considering diversity, noise and exercise equipment, basically between Rucker Street and Jefferson Street. Slide 45 that you just looked at, the game tables and seating isn't clear. There's a picture that's uh, numbered 88, which has site furniture. And that particular one, the tables and chairs of 88, they have backs to them. And so we advocate for game tables with backs for four players and enough space to accommodate wheelchairs between Rutgers and Jefferson Street. Slide 80 uh, shows sonic architecture kids' drums. Uh, LESPP advocates for elimination of the kids' drums. Uh, people thought that that would be too much noise. Um, at the September meeting, um, residents shared concern. Um, it's the picture down at the bottom. Um, concert, shared concern about uh, desire for the same equipment that's presently between Rutgers and Jefferson. There's many seniors who use it. If you look, I think it's about slide uh, 88, it might be, where they show North Fitness. And it doesn't show, uh, maybe before that one, it doesn't show like before that one, but any, right, right, the next one, the next one, um, the next one. Uh, okay, well, anyway, the North Fitness, I think it's slide 88, you're at 83. Um, shows like people and they really know a lot of the equipment that's there now is like seated equipment. That's the chairs and tables that we were talking about. And then if you look at the fitness, presently they have a lot of fitness that is, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's slide 84 and 85. The fitness that they have now, quite a bit of the fitness, right, quite a bit of the fitness uh, 
equipment they have now is things that you can sit on. This is like almost all very kind of active that probably the seniors probably would not want to do. So those were the only things that we had was the noise from the drums, uh, the fitness equipment. They like the equipment that they have. A lot have seats um, and game tables where, with chairs, with backs and enough room to accommodate people with wheelchairs. One of the things people talked about was the fact that we have a lot of folks, a lot of older folks that like to play dominoes. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Valentina, did you provide this in writing to the team or... Yes, I, I uploaded, excuse me, I have to apologize. I'm a senior citizen. <laughs> I did not grow up in the era of digital whatever. So I had a hard time, but I think I uploaded it because it had to be a PDF to be uploaded. Okay. I don't even know what upload is, but I think I did it. Well, I have, I have your contact information in case we need it. <laughs> okay, good, thank you so much. <laughs> I can confirm that we did receive that letter from Valiatina just this morning. Signe, are you, you are muted. Let me un unmute Signe. And I, we do not have anyone else who has signed up to testify. If anyone at any time in um, if I missed you, you can use the raise hand feature, star nine, um, to, if you're on the phone, it's star nine. If you're uh, in the Zoom meeting, it's a, it should be at the bottom of the participants menu. But it looks like we're ready for commissioner questions and deliberation. So that uh, is what I was going to <clears throat> suggest. Um, would someone like, I can't see, I only see the, the, um, presenters views, but I want to thank the presenters for uh, getting through a tremendous amount of information in a record time. Uh, looks very, very uh, comprehensive. And, uh, you know, just for, I think for the general public who might be listening, I, I think that this project uh, is doing something that we really need to focus on, which is um, addressing nuisance flooding. So I appreciate that uh, uh, you are uh, taking this bull by the horns and creating a lot of, uh, I think, interesting topography out of a space that is very dark uh, and seemingly to many people unwelcome, but through your design, you are really activating it and also uh, dealing with, a, with a, what will soon be a very regular challenge. So thank you. Um, just to avoid noise, uh, please feel free, any commissioner, to speak. Just, I just had some time comments on the uh, the graphics and signage. Um, I think there are two. You know, there's the typography and graphics for the flood walls, which is continued from the ESCR, and you know. I, I don't have a problem like with the change to uh, not like listing the numbers um, prominently as in um, you know further north. You know as long as the uh, you know the naming system makes sense. There was one part where it shows the names of the different slips, market slip, etc. And so I think you know I think that's actually a different you know it, it takes the older kind of like graphics from the floodgates, but I think that that design has been updated. But also I think that is actually maybe a different like realm or domain. I think that's actually more like a part. So this, you know, should this take the graphics from, you know, the typography from the floodgates or should it, you know, I think actually should, it should take, you know, the kind of signage precedence for the East River Esplanade. Um, I think I think there's an, another kind of, um, precedent for like this kind of signage, which is almost more like Pike Park signage. So I, I, I'd investigate that there's, you know, investigate that because I, I think there is another, um, another uh, convention set for, you know, what's like park signage, which relates to, you know, the interpretive signage and other directories in the area. And I think that's called the East River Esplanade. I don't know if anyone else has any you know, background information on that. But I just noticed that as we were going through that. 
Mm -hmm. These graphics relate more to the floodgates and maybe should relate actually more to the park signage for this area. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to say thank you for that comment. And um, what's shown currently um, in the engraved image, uh, in the image on the screen now does use the same font as the approved ESCR gate signage. So that's right. Um, we can certainly explore um, the signage approach and the graphic approach to be more in line with uh, the BPR standard signage um, to kind of follow uh, the East River Esplanade um, uh, standards. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, this is Lori Hawkinson. I had a question. I also wanted to um, second Signe's um, remark that this is extremely comprehensive and very well presented and concise. So I really appreciate that. Um, I had a question about the, uh, in, in the context where this connects into the rest of the ERE, the, uh, that Hanover hex paving that we just saw in that image, maybe we could go back to that. Yes. So I assume that that matches the other paving. It looks very pink. Um, so I'm just a little confused. I thought it was more beige -ish in color. It looks very pink here. And I just want to confirm that this is the same it's contiguous. This isn't like a new piece of hex paving in a different pattern. Is that correct? Yeah, Lori, thank you for that. It, that is correct. I think it might just be a resolution issue, but perhaps on the screen or in our image. But the intent is mm -hmm. that uh, we're replacing the existing um, larger size hex pavers in the same pattern wherever we disturb them. Okay. And then I think we had a comment that, or I had a comment that maybe is in the text, but it had to do with the vertical elements where I think you're using the strong colors, which I think is very successful because they punctuate and kind of help break up the long scale of this project, uh, which is extreme um, <laughs> in any means. But I was wondering about the color that you're using underneath the these areas. And I'm just, I mean, I just hope that it um, can stay clean. I'm just, you know, because if it gets too light, I mean, how is this going to be clean, this surface? It's really... This is a very challenging area, obviously. You've got water coming down, all kinds of things happening, and people walking from the street. I mean, it's not, you know, easy to main. Well, I mean, it's maintainable, but, but to keep it clean is my concern and look clean. That's a great comment. I, just to clarify, are you speaking about the image on the screen specifically in the play area? Yeah, or just sort of yeah the that kind of an area where you have the play surface and in the, where it's a lighter color. I, I don't know, I'm just imagining, you know, there's this quote, you know, the world's a big place unless you have to clean it. Um, so just having to clean, uh, or, or it's a small world unless you have to clean it. Sorry, the small world unless you have to clean it because um, it's, it just seems like the light colors are gonna be more difficult to maintain. So just in this area, especially. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. And um, we have been working, as I mentioned closely with, um, uh, Department of Parks and Recreation on the selection of the both the product and the materials that we're using in the play areas and also mm -hmm. on their colors. And so what we're showing what we're showing here is um, safety surface tiles um, on the ground plane. And um, one of the uh, decisions that we made as a, as a team is to actually take sort of the striping pattern that you see on the gates and rotate that um, so you get a little bit more of a randomized pattern. So in the event that any one of these tiles needs to be um, replaced or is damaged or, or is sort of irreparably um, you know, marked, it can be removed and replaced <clears throat> without um, a great disturbance to the pattern overall. Um, in res respect to the play equipment, um, we're working very closely again with PPR to um, select where the most appropriate color and material will go on the equipment um, with the um, expertise from the manufacturers as well um, to reduce maintenance needs on those. So the, the color you see in the image right here of full yellow um, is um, just uh, in progress. And so you can kind of see these bubbles of color on top and we're gonna be working to uh, refine the color approach for these areas specifically. Um, oh, I was the, thinking specifically of the play surface area, right? Okay. That you're walking on, that everybody's running around on. That's the one I was just making note of who's going to clean that. <laughs> oh, Nancy's going to clean it. Great. 
<laughs> no, no, no. I didn't raise my hand to clean it. Um, it's These are colors that we have used in other um, parks and playgrounds. And mm -hmm. um, to be honest, they, they, they don't really get cleaned. Um, mm -hmm. um, so, so they will look a little duller over time. And then maybe we'll look at the very lightest blue. Um, the yellow is in the play equipment, which should stay bright. But uh, maybe we'll, together with the EDC and the designers, look at the very lightest blue and, and see if we should um, maybe change that. Because that, I could see that, that that might show the dirt the best out of all these. The choices. best, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a way we don't like, so. Okay. Thank you. Hi. May I ask a question? Yes, go ahead, Ethel. Yes, thank you. I just wondered if anyone on the team uh, can, or maybe in the future, uh, respond to any of the points made by Ms. Jones as she uh, made them today. Yes, thank you for that. Um, I'm happy to start, and then uh, as well, we have um, uh, Tom and Lauren on the line as well. You can help respond. I think the to talk about the the comment about the game table specifically, um, we have worked closely again with our, our agency stakeholders to um, develop uh, game tables that do meet all of the uh, most up to date accessibility requirements, and so those should be designed in a way to provide seating with backs as well as companion seating um, for the game tables in each of the gathering areas along the social pockets. Um, with respect to um, the noise and of the, um, the small drums, um, I think we're happy to take a look at that um, and address that comment as a design team. Um, for the, the final comment of the type of uh, furnishing equipment uh, in the fitness areas, um, we did work very closely um, to select um, the kind of most appropriate equipment with Parks. So I wonder if, um, I know we have Nancy on the line or um, I believe Grace as well, if you have thoughts on that. I think, you know, from our point of view, we're, we're certainly happy to take another look at that. Yeah. Okay, I don't, okay. if you could all um, work together on that and uh, be responsive, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the height of the fencing around the play areas. I believe right now it's shown at four feet. Um, can these, this be lowered to what your other standard parks have at three six? Yes, they mentioned that in the presentation, I believe. But the comment, our, our comments say uh, that it's being considered. Oh. I just want to know whether it's being considered positively or not. It, it's, it's yes, we received that comment and um, passed it on. We've discussed it with Parks, and so we will. We will. Yes. Can I? Can I unmute? Yes. Um, this is Nancy. Our the typical fencing we put around playgrounds is four feet. Um, we do in front of swings. We do a shorter um, fence. Uh, did you still want something shorter than what we typically put around playgrounds? Um, well, I I do think that. Uh, four feet seems excessive here. I mean, have you had incidents with kids pole vaulting over a four foot fence? I mean, I don't understand why do we, it really is objectionable right on the water, it seems to me. You're muted, man. Okay. Yes, yeah. yes, I was trying to. I was trying to unmute. Um, uh, you know, we we haven't had um, significant problems with people, um, kids going over, over three and a half foot fences. Um, you know, it's something we haven't tried a lot. Um, so, you know, I think I think that would be okay. Um, this is, this is an area with some vehicles nearby. I mean, with um, you know, streets nearby. But I think that would be all right. I guess the question is, um, so what you're saying is that you you actually don't have a precedent of a perimeter three foot six fence. Right, okay, I'm seeing your nod. So if you could, if you could please look at it and maybe we can set a new precedent here that would be lower, that would be great. Um, uh, are there any other commissioners who would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question?
I, I don't see any. I don't see any hands raised. I had one oh, more. Okay. Sorry, I had one more question. I forgot to bring up. There's you have a fence shown on top of the flood wall. Um, did you have a? Can you show that again? I I didn't get to see that. So you have the flood wall, and then there's a condition where it, then you have fence on top of it, so that it becomes the same height as another fence. Yeah. Um, I don't have the slide number, but I was just wondering, we didn't really get to see what that is and what that, what's going on there. So, um, um, yeah, along yeah, that other one. yeah. Uh, I think it'd be further down uh, at Pier 36. I think it just went flipped by really quickly. I saw here? Here. 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 Yes. Yes. Shows it. yes. And yeah, what's the next slide will show the kind of starting condition. So yeah, this is the one. Yeah. Are, um, the wall, uh, as it gets below eight feet, uh, we need to provide a security fence on top of the wall for the portions uh, where it is below eight feet to maintain the, the required security clearances. Mm -hmm. um, so on top of the wall, we're planning to do a, um, well, and then in relation to that, uh, on the other side, uh, so the, the existing chain link fence that we're showing uh, is an existing mm -hmm. condition. Um, so we're using the HBU to tie those two things together. And then the, the fence that we're gonna have on top of the flood wall right now is planned to be a similar uh, black chain link fence. Okay. All right. And that would, that would stretch for uh, so the first two. Matches the other. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating. Let me uh, try to uh, quickly summarize here. Um, there are some items that have been discussed regarding um, uh, signage, uh, some uh, uh, fencing, re responsiveness to um, the comments that were raised by um, the uh, spokesperson for the community. And so, um, but I think in general, you all seem um, like the kinds of questions that would come up at this stage of uh, a presentation. So um, we just urge you to keep collaborating among the agencies with the community. Uh, and uh, we look forward to this uh, coming back, but it's a very thoughtful project and a very difficult site. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, right, we have to so vote. We are voting, yes. Terribly yes. sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I am now going to take a roll call on item 27605. Um, commissioners, when I call your name, if you could please state your vote for um, the project, approve, reject, table, or abstain. Um, and if you feel like you need to make a final comment, please do so. So, Phil Ahrens. Uh, approve. Uh, Lori Hawkinson. Approve. Manuel Miranda. Approve. Susan Morgenthau. Approve. Ethel Sheffer. Approve. Meryl Tisch. Approve. And uh, Signe Nielsen, approve. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let the record show that we have all in favor and the project is approved. Uh, so please move forward. Thank you. Yeah. And we'll we'll work with uh, with Parks on the uh, conditions uh, as detailed in the comments. Great. Thank you all very much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to move on to the next item, which is two seven six zero six, a distinctive sidewalk at eleven Point Street in Brooklyn, for which. I will not be participating. Um, so uh, Phil, I believe that this will be turned over to you to uh, manage. And at the end, just to give you a heads up, um, there will be a vote on this, uh, uh, on this project. So um, if you just ask people for that and we can move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I am muted and. Bill, I can email you the script um, once this presentation gets started. That'd be perfect. Thanks, Grace. That'd be great. Thank you, Grace. I could probably remember it, but it's okay. <laughs> and Signe has been placed in the waiting room. And so if you are watching the 
meeting right now on YouTube and you would like to join, there are instructions for doing so in the description below the video. And you'll also find a sign-in form in case you would like to give public testimony, you can sign up so we will know to call your name. And uh, I think we're ready to begin. So I think we need to unmute Regina Meyer and Kate Sella. Good morning. Good morning. 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 Um, thanks so much. Is it okay to start? I'm sort of new to this. Okay. Um, hi, um, members of the PDC Commission. Um, and of course, to the uh, PDC staff, thank you so much for arranging this session um, and all of your feedback thus far. Um, I'm Regina Meyer. I'm president of the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. Um, we're so pleased um, to be working with DOT on looking at um, how to improve the streetscape and public realm in downtown Brooklyn and happily have had um, an, inc an opportunity to fast track a project that is before you today. Um, so the goal of today's agenda is to um, go through um, some specific um, talk about context at first and I'll do that and then I'll turn it over to Kate Sella at um, Big who will go through some of the details that we have the opportunity to fast track with DOT. Um, the next slide um, really shows the overall goals of our project here at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. And that is to really look at the entirety of downtown Brooklyn um, to improve streetscapes where we can establish a stronger sense of place and strengthen identity. And um, this to me is um, really important that we take this on right now because although there's been big projects that have moved forward on arterials in downtown Brooklyn over the past decade or so, um, we really want to pay attention here to the core of downtown Brooklyn um, that hasn't seen improvements in, in, a, in a long time. Um, the next slide Kate, um, shows the location of 11 Hoyt Street in specific on the right, and then of course places downtown Brooklyn on the left in the um, in the city, which of course um, you all are really familiar with. I'd say the one thing that's interesting about the 11 Hoyt Street site, um, right, um, as a um, a fast tracked item, is that. It's um, really located in the center of downtown Brooklyn, right across the street from Macy's, right down the block from Fulton Street. Um, it was um, the site of the former very large and um, uh, a Macy's above ground parking structure. Um, so it's very centrally located in the downtown. Um, the next slide, Kate, um, is really meant to um, emphasize how much has changed in downtown Brooklyn over the past two decades. And I'd say the one thing, um, and uh, you all have seen so much of this change in, in, your, in your various studies and, and, and various um, projects, is, is that downtown Brooklyn now is no longer characterized as just as a shopping street along Fulton Street and a government center. It's truly a mixed juice downtown. We've seen an incredible growth in um, not just a, apartments, um, but also increase in retail and entertainment, office jobs, um, and schools. Um, and all of that really has, has changed the character of the downtown over the past decade and a half. The next slide um, show, it shows how much um, attention has been brought by the city um, in the past two decades to get downtown Brooklyn to where it is today. Of course, you all are aware of the Flatbush Avenue reconstruction, the, the gateway at Tillery, um, the gateway at the Brooklyn Bridge, Albee Square, the um, huge investment in on um, behalf of the city at the cultural districts and of course in, in the public realm adjacent to the cultural district. And I think all of these things have really made downtown Brooklyn what it is. It ha would not have evolved without this incredible amount of, of city um, intervention over the past two decades. Um, the next slide Kate, um, does show um, and emphasize 
some of the remaining challenges that we really think need to be addressed and why we brought um, BIG and um, WXY on to look at them. Um, really, there's still a lack of green space in on the core streets. The sidewalk conditions on many of the streets has is really insubstantial, um, at times as narrow as eight feet and really hasn't been looked at since the post-war era. Still, there's a great deal of congestion and multimodal conflicts, especially on some of the narrow streets as um, uh, biking and walking have become um, much more important to our downtown. And honestly, um, there's a lot of inconsistencies. And, and we've heard a lot of this from our steering committees. Um, we've met with the community and community members and steering committee members for the past year and a half. And they really do raise the lack of green, the, the narrow width of sidewalks and the harshness of the downtown as items um, that they'd like to see improved. Um, the plan that, that you'll hear um, more about um, addresses some of these items directly by proposing sidewalk widenings, enhanced greenings, and um, distinctive sidewalks. And so you'll you'll hear more of those details in this in this application before you. Um, the next slide goes to this issue of the fast track that that some of you have raised. And so we're trying to um, explain this a little bit on this on this chart. Um, and I, again, I want to thank DOT for the incredible partnership here. Um, as you see in the top of the slide, um, the, the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership engaged um, WXY and BIG about a year and a half ago um, to work on a, digit, a district vision that we released last at the end of last year. Um, and we got some nice feedback from the community that they appreciated our ideas for increased greening and, and increased pedestrian space. Um, we were able to continue our work with WXY and BIG this year in what we're calling phase three. And in that phase, what we decided to do was focus on some of the spaces that we knew were under change. Uh, um, and um, 11 Hoyt is one of those. The next slide shows um, the overall themes of, of the vision plan to make downtown Brooklyn safer, greener, more walkable, and more engaging. And I know I'm, just, I'm, I'm speeding up for time here. Um, the next slide um, shows that some of the work that we um, are thinking about to overall make downtown Brooklyn more walkable is to really look hard at the bike net, the bus network, which really impacts Fulton Street and Livingston Street and perhaps streamline that. So um, uh, buses are both better used and um, we can look at st um, street width more in depth. The next slide, Kate, shows how we could um, possibly improve the bike network once there are some changes to the bus network. And these are items that we're talking about with DOT and the New York City Transit Authority. Um, that would greatly improve east-west access on buses. Kate, the next slide shows some of the work that we have specifically identified where downtown Brooklyn is not um, green. There's so many places on the left side of the left side of the slide that show where we don't have street trees and we don't have um, um, a green feel to downtown and um, the right side shows locations that we are focusing on. The next slide um, really emphasizes how many sidewalks are narrow and substandard and um, how um, we're committed to be working with DOT um, to address this via um, their program for shared streets or sidewalk widenings when we can. Um, and 11 Hoyt, as you can see, is central to, in those locations as well. Um, as you can see, um, some of our um, other projects that we would like to bring to you um, in the future, perhaps early next year, are looking at um, expansion of this um, pedestrian network at 4th and Atlantic. That's a project with DDC and DOT. 
um, also looking um, at um, Willoughby um, Street as a shared street, which is a key east-west street, as well as looking at Red Hook Lane and Pearl Street. Um, the next slide, Kate, um, shows um, further um, locations for enhanced greening and retrofits um, on Fulton Mall and Albee Square and also um, at permanent plazas at Atlantic and Forth. Um, next, um, and I'm gonna now turn it over to Kate um, at Big, who's gonna describe um, more in detail the uh, project at 11 Hoyt. Thank you, Regina, and thank you everyone for allowing us to present today. So through our work with Downtown Brooklyn, we've developed um, several toolkit strategies to help deal with implementation since it's such a large district. So these include geometry, greening, furniture, color, and materiality. For geometry, what we're really talking about is creating a cohesive design and pedestrian experience. So using sort of a single bubble for a temporary or pilot project, or also using several single bubbles and, a, and sort of combining them to create a larger plaza. In terms of capital projects, we're really looking to expand sidewalks wherever possible and enhance greening, especially in ground greening. So whether that can be done on a single block or two blocks together to create a shared street is what we're looking to do. Um, this is our greening toolkit. So we're looking at everything from indirect green facades to expanding sidewalks to do in-ground planting. Where that's not possible, we would like to do raised planters with trees. Um, and then also wh where we can do in-ground planting, we're really looking at incorporating bioswales and rain gardens to help reduce stormwater runoff. Um, so our vision is really to enhance, really about enhanced greening at 11 Hoyt and sort of taking your standard existing tree pit, which has quite a narrow pedestrian circulation pathway against the facade, and pushing it out into the street, expanding the sidewalks, increasing the pedestrian flow. And then we have to soften all of the geometry to work with the 12 foot radius required by um, street sweepers. And in addition, we're pinching in the middle of the planter to create a pedestrian seating area where you can be sort of enveloped by green and out of the main circulation path. Um, and ultimately, we do want to create shared streets on both Hoyt and Elm. So that would include additional measures when possible um, of a bench on the street side. So this is not an inward looking design. Um, so we've also really developed and worked on district wide planter typologies with a range. So for narrow sidewalks, we're really looking at just adding a, a softening the typical rectilinear planter to be more pill shaped where we are expanding sidewalks, we're looking to incorporate the curvilinear pinched planter. And where an increased understory planting is not possible, we're looking at just using circular planters. Um, so these are our material palettes. This is a pilot material palette, which I'll go into in more detail later. But we're really trying to focus on making it colorful, recognizable, green, tactical, implementable, and low cost. Whereas our capital pilot, our, our capital palette is really inspired by the newly renovated Macy's facade, which has wonderful Art Deco details and glazed terracotta tiles. Um, and from the glazed terracotta tiles, we were really inspired to come up with a timeless and very durable material and palette, and really focused on using standard DOT materials in a sort of slightly different way with by pigmenting concrete. Um, by using as much in-ground planting as we can with core 10 steel planters and integrated benches. Um, so this sort of is an axon view of a capital material palette. So we're really showing how we're using the pigmented concrete to, um, to highlight the widened sidewalks and the enhanced greening. So it really is just around the planter. And the idea is that it would not need to be a uniformly implemented distinctive sidewalk. It's not meant to be block by block. It's meant to be where possible and blend back into the existing sidewalk. And then for the pilot projects, we're really looking at expanding the sidewalk at the same grade elevation by using rubber curves with a decomposed granite infill. So it's 
ADA and accessible to more people, and then using raised planters where possible. Um, so these, as Regina mentioned, we looked at 10 project sites across the district with WXY. These are all the locations. And these projects in terms of, these are early action capital projects. 11 Hoyt is one. We also looked at Fleet Street and One Born Place. These three projects would be funded largely by, project, by private developers. Um, and in addition, we looked at DOT's upcoming Flatbush Avenue capital project and how we can incorporate the distinctive planter typologies into this. Um, and then for pilot projects, we've looked at 11 Hoyt, turning both Elm and Hoyt Street into shared streets. We've also looked at Gallatin Place, which would be an extension of the current seasonal street on Lawrence. Um, we've looked at enhancing the existing shared street on Willoughby using a few of our toolkit elements and a little bit more color. And in addition, we've also looked at Grove Alley. So this is Hoyt Street and the existing conditions, as Regina mentioned. There's a, there's a lack of green and the sidewalks are substandard, especially on the 11 Hoyt side of the street where they're only 10 feet. On Elm Street, sorry, slow. On Elm Street, there's one existing tree up by um, the Fulton Mall and the sidewalks along on the west side of the street and the 11 Hoyt side of the street in particular are quite substandard. They're only eight feet wide and currently there are no trees proposed as a result. Livingston, we feel the sidewalks are substantial and we're not looking to increase them. They're over 15 feet and have several street trees. The Fulton Mall obviously has very sufficient uh, sidewalk width for pedestrians. However, we do want to look at enhancing the greening. Several of the tree pits are currently missing trees. Um, so this is the existing 11 Hoyt plan per the current approved BPP with 10 foot wide sidewalks on Hoyt Street and five standard tree pits, five by 10. The same on Livingston, there are seven existing trees and standard tree pits. On Elm Street, there are no trees being proposed due to the narrow eight foot sidewalk width. So our plan um, widens the sidewalks. As Regina mentioned, we've worked very hard with DOT, who's been wonderful um, in terms of expediting this review. So FDNY and DOT have agreed we can narrow the roadway to 20 feet and expand the sidewalks. So that means nearly an eight foot sidewalk expansion on Hoyt and an eight and a half foot sidewalk expansion on Elm Street. And through the sidewalk expansion, we're able to add up to seven new trees. And we're also able to add nearly 900 square feet of in-ground planting. 500, over 500 square feet were trying to make rain gardens on Elm Street. So these are the cross sections of the existing street. As you can see on Livingston, we're not recommending a sidewalk expansion. We are recommending enhanced greening in the understory. Um, as I said, Hoyt Street, it's nearly an eight foot sidewalk extension that's been approved. And Elm Place, it's over eight and a half feet. So it would be a huge difference. Um, so our presentation today includes several options for distinctive um, Sidewalk materials, this is option one, where we really were trying to use standard DOT materials, um, unpigmented concrete directly against the facade and trying to maintain the five by five scoring pattern. And then using just a pigmented concrete to really highlight the sidewalk extension in the enhanced greening um, and sort of um, have more colors, we move out towards the curb line. And in addition, we're looking at using a Corten steel planter guard with an in integrated bench. So this is what that would look like. This is a view of Hoyt Street and the expanded sidewalks and the pigmented concrete with the curvilinear lines that would respond to the in-ground planting and enhanced greening. Um, this is the view of Livingston Street where you can see where we don't have any greening. We have very standard five by five sidewalk scoring. And this is the view of Elm Street. So this would be a huge change on Elm Street going from no green to quite a bit. Um, so we're very excited about that. And this is an axon view of Hoyt Street, sort of again, showing how the sidewalks not meant to be uniformly everywhere. The distinctive sidewalk is really meant to then blend back into the existing to really call out the enhancements we're making. 
And this is a view of Elm Street, the same thing, sort of how we would go back to the standard um, unpigmented sidewalk with typical sidewalk scoring before the BPP limits. So option two, um, based on some feedback the last few months, we tried to limit the curvilinear geometry and use more of the standard uh, DOT sidewalks so using an unpigmented concrete with permeable pavers. We really looked at trying to make this a best practice landscape uh, approach with the permeable pavers will help reduce stormwater runoff and increase groundwater recharge. Um, so the distinctive elements would be the geometry of the curvilinear outline of the pavers, the permeable pavers in core 10 steel planter guards and integrated bench. We are looking at a range of permeable paver options. A final selection is dependent upon your input as well as cost and availability. We're looking at everything from precast concrete with decomposed granite to pretty standard Belgium blocks that we see throughout the city to resin, potentially resin bound gravel, um, which has been used in other areas and seems to be quite durable. Um, so then, oops, this stuff. Here's a view of Hoyt Street. So again, maintaining the curvilinear geometry to really sort of highlight where we're able to expand sidewalks and increase greening. Um, this is the view on Livingston Street showing the same thing. And, oops, sorry, and Elm Street. Um, so all three options use the same amount of enhanced greening. Option three only has the curvilinear planters with standard DOT concrete that's a 555 scoring pattern. So you can see, so we're down to just the distinctive element being the core 10 steel planter guard with integrated bench. And here's a view of what that would look like from Hoyt Street. So still we would have all of the enhanced greening. Um, and then this is just, just an overview of furniture options. As we've moved through this process, process with the PDC staff, we really have just started to develop this planter guard with an integrated bench. And we plan to work further on um, developing this so the ADA companion seating is aligned with the bench and would appreciate feedback. So this is to summarize all three options. The first option is the pigmented concrete to really sort of define and call out and celebrate the enhanced greening and standard and widened sidewalks. Option two with permeable pavers and option three with a distinctive planter only. And then we wanted to take a moment to talk with you about phase two to make this a full complete block treatment. We would look at enhancing the existing planters on the Fulton Mall, basically um, replacing the trees that are missing as well as um, expanding the understory and adding a new integrated bench on the planter that promotes a bit more social seating than the current straight benches. And then for the pilot projects, we really have been looking at sort of standard off the shelf items that are used elsewhere in the city, such as a rubber curb. It's currently used on 14th Street at the bus islands and filling it with gravel and decomposed granite, again, to keep this at the same elevation, make it more accessible. It's also a very porous, permeable material that decomposed granite is ADA compliant, but it would not affect the overall street drainage. Um, so this is how phase one would look on Elm Place, for instance. And then phase two, we're really looking at um, a sidewalk expansion using rubber curbs and decomposed granite, and then providing a lot of raised trees and planters. Um, and then using vibrant colors and art to highlight the pedestrian areas around the subway, really focusing on expanding the public realm at the subway entrances and exits. Um, so that's our presentation for today. If you have any questions or comments, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we do not have anyone signed up to give public testimony. So I will hand it over to Phil. Um, thank you. Um, do we have any commissioners who would like to uh, uh, either raise questions or give comments? may take a minute for them to unmute. Yeah. 
Lori, did you want to speak? Yeah, I, I can speak. Um, so I guess of the three, I think I would uh, thank you anyway for the thorough presentation. I really appreciate it and the understanding the whole context of where this exists um, in the larger, uh, larger, larger plan. Um, I would. I was going to speak to option two because it uh, is a more performative design um, in that we have the permeable pavers together with the rain garden planters and seeding, um, and that it minimizes the distinctive sidewalk uh, to just those areas where we're where you're 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 adding those performative pieces, and uh, I think in general we've tried to minimize distinctive sidewalks throughout the city. So just in being kind of in keeping with that uh, overall uh, condition. And I had a question about the art there. You, I, I didn't catch it before when we, when I saw this earlier, but the, there's an art component uh, that you mentioned at the temporary project that you show in this big hot pink. What is that art component? Do we like, how is that going to be? Well, um, that, that, no art has been chosen um, that was um, meant to um, evoke the idea that if we were to do temporary projects, um, um, we would look toward mu murals. Um, what's one thing that um, DBP has had success in the past in a, in a place called Grove Alley. Um, mm. So that was just meant as a placeholder at this point, Lori. Oh, okay, great, thanks. Are, are there any other commissioners with uh, comments? No comment. Um, if not, um, I just have a couple of thoughts I might as well uh, deliver. Um, it's extremely difficult, Regina, to approve um, an isolated um, instance uh, of a somewhat um, unusual project um, without uh, having the opportunity to seeing the full plan. Um, I understand that the uh, situation with a building being built and a developer wanting to finish, and uh, I think the um, partnership looking for an opportunity to get maybe a pilot done um, is somewhat compelling. Um, but I think that while it's easy at this point to say to you that it's fine to sign off on expanding um, the pedestrian presence on the sidewalk. It's hard to argue with increasing the greening in downtown Brooklyn. Um, I don't think um, based on conversations we've had internally um, that this vote should in any way um, suggest that there is commission support for um, the pinking uh, of the downtown uh, Brooklyn uh, streetscape, um, the curvilinear um, shape of the street program, um, uh, the use of Cortan steel on raised planting beds, uh, or any of the elements um, that have been put forward. Um, and I think that um, that needs to be understood by everyone. Um, I think I, I'm not speaking just for myself, but for others, um, perhaps even a majority on the commission, um, that alternative two, as Lori has suggested, um, is by far, uh, I think, the best. Um, and I think in the interest of moving forward, we would accept that. Um, but we will not be bound um, in our further review um, by any of the specific design elements um, that are uh, presented here in our review of either the next pilot project uh, or hopefully even better, uh, the review of the entire plan uh, when you have the opportunity to bring it to us. Um, so uh, that's uh, all I need to say. Um, uh, and unless there are other commissioners um, who wish to speak, um, we can probably uh, go forward with a vote. Um, thank you, Phil. Just one thing I would add is that, uh, you know, we are still concerned about, uh, in general, uh, even with option two, things like maintenance and ADA accessibility. So we will definitely need to see further work uh, to ensure that, that the design is something that, 
can can be maintained long term. Uh, you know, in in a, a general way, we've had issues with maintenance on distinctive uh, sidewalk elements, and uh, especially to push to make sure that it's uh, as inclusive a streetscape as possible uh, while we're meeting these uh, sort of more environmental considerations. So I just wanted to, to note that, and that would be uh, a, a condition. Justin, thank you. Okay, um, I, we will now uh, take a roll call vote on item uh, 27605. Commissioners, when I call your name, please state your vote, uh, either approve, reject, table or abstain. Um, and you're welcome, of course, to make any final comment to contextualize um, that vote. Uh, Lori? I'll approve with option two, if I can say that. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Manuel? Approve with option two. Susan? Approve with option two. Ethel? Approve with option two. Uh, Merrill? Approve with option two. And my vote as well um, is to approve uh, with option two. So I'll let the record show all are in favor um, and this project is approved um, with the conditions um, that will be indicated um, by the staff. Um, thank you all. The public meeting <laughs> is now concluded and we'll adjourn till next month. Thank, thank you. you very much.